Hello and welcome to Mr C's History Walks. I am here standing by Pudding Lane. Why? Well, of course, for the Great Fire of London. We'll look at the causes, the events of the Inferno and the conflagration and its impact, specifically and really notably, the death toll. Because question marks are around this and uh, history tells us that not many people died of the Great Fire of London, but I actually think that's not true. And actually there are quite a lot of victims who paid in their lives. Stick to the end to find out more and why. I am walking down Pudding Lane, which nowadays is a very nondescript, rather boring looking road. And indeed, they've got this really horrible sort of 1960s, 70s brutalist building. But here you will find actually a plaque to the Great Farm of London. And this is a good place to start to talk about the causes. So here is this rather drab looking plaque here just saying, how this was the site of the bakery owned by Thomas Farriner, but somebody subsequently has actually bought, uh, made a more accurate uh, plaque to describe the location just down here actually on Monument Street, So, which is this little plaque here, which we can just see with the date of 1666 as to when the actual fire was, because this is believed actually where the location of the very oven it was, not quite almost on Pudding Lane, maybe a little bit, uh, and that's supposedly where the oven which started this. Let's talk more about the causes now. Well, the short-term causes are obvious. At first, at one in the morning on the 2nd of September 1666, Thomas Farriner, the baker who here, um, here on Pudding Lane, went to bed. He, and obviously as a baker, you have your ovens on going on through the night to be ready for the morning. His ovens, there must have been a spark gone from the oven onto some hay or something. It set a light. This is kind of what you expect. They would have awoken a couple of hours earlier with the whole ground floor of their bakery oven, bakery full of smoke, full of fire. So what they had to do is they had to jump from their upstairs bedrooms to the neighboring house. Um, and actually, interestingly, uh, Thomas Farron had a maid who was afraid of heights and she refused to jump. And therefore, unfortunately, she died in the fire as their bakery and their house was consumed by fire. The first victim of the Great Fire of London. Again, how many? We'll answer this question, hopefully. Uh, and then it, a couple of hours later, the parish council here got to it, found it, and so, oh yes, there is a fire. Uh, and so they decided to call the mayor, uh, Thomas Bloodworth, more on him is soon. And he, just, the usual in 1660s, the firefighting mechanism would be that you tear houses down. There's no real water, no, I mean, there would have been a little bit of water in leather buckets, but not very good enough to put out a raging fire as it was then. So you would pull down the houses with these long sticks, and we'll look at some what they might have looked like. Thomas Bloodworth decided no, because he was afraid that the owners of those houses, who couldn't be found because they were rented, would be upset. So he decided for those houses to keep standing. What an error, because it meant the fire spread and spread and spread. Well, the long-term causes, of course, was it had been a very long and dry and hot summer. Coupled with the real main long-term cause is that everything is made of wood. As we'll see some of these houses, not only are they made of wood, but they sort of overhang and it's very crowded. So one little spark, one fire, and the whole city is at a great risk. So putting his bakery here would have just been a bit of a, a risk. The other key thing which is really interesting is the weather that night, the wind. Usually in Britain and London, the wind comes from the west over to the east. But for, you know, geometric or, you know, various different reasons, the wind was coming from the east and going towards the city that way. Because if the wind had been going the other way, it would, might have just gone over to East London into the fields, not, not as big a deal. Bad, but not as big a deal. The fact it was going west meant the fire spread to the main urban bit where the fire really got hold in the city centre with all the wood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all the main causes of the Great Fire of London. Just a very quick side note, obviously it's very well named, isn't it? Pudding Lane to be where there's a bakery. But um, don't associate it with the sweet pudding that we have. Pudding was more associated like steak and kidney pudding. Pies with offal and with liver and kidney and stuff like that. So Thomas Farron of the Baker, who actually did supply baked goods for the king, probably more, was more likely to make things involving livers and spleens and stomachs and stuff, rather than nice sweet puddings, I'm afraid. Now, Pudding Lane obviously looks nothing like it did in the 1660s, and indeed most of the city of London doesn't. But just two rows down from Pudding Lane is Lovett Lane here. And again, modern buildings, but actually we get a slightly better sense of what it might have been like, certainly the narrowness 
the darkness. It's really dark in here and almost the, so the overhanging, you can see how close the houses would be. And as we'll just go have a look, the jetties that were hanging out made of wood would have made it a very, very dangerous place in the event of a fire. This is All Hallows Church by the Tower in the City of London. It's the oldest church in the City of London and indeed it is a survivor of the Great Fire. The fire raised just under the road uh, to the next of us here, but it was saved because the Navy were based just next to it and the uh, Mr. Penn, who was the uh, sort of the curate of this church, he organized the men to destroy all the buildings around it so none of them could uh, cause any fire to spread and they tried to douse a certain water, etc, etc, etc. So it survived. Interestingly, that chap Penn, who uh, was the curate here, his son went on to be William Penn, creator of um, Pennsylvania, etc, etc, etc. Another interesting connection to the Great Fire in London for this church is Samuel Pepys, who lived just uh, opposite it in Seething Lane. He decided to climb to the top of it as he heard reports of the uh, Great Fire over in Pudding Lane. And he climbed to the top and he said that he's never seen such a sight of desolation, uh, which is interesting. And he ran home to, and he scurried a few things. And one of those famous things, of course, that Samuel Pepys did is he decided to bury his Parmesan cheese, a huge Parmesan cheese, in his garden because it was so expensive. He wanted it to survive, but he couldn't quite carry it as he ran away. So he buried it in the garden. And I do believe it survived, much like All Hallows Behind Me. Rather wonderfully, one of the most famous survivors of the Great Fire of London is actually a pub. It was a tavern and a pub at the time, and it still is today the old wine trades here on Martin Street, which is absolutely fantastic. It still very bears much similar thing, probably more baby Victorian, but with the wine bottles in the window, etc., etc. They might not have changed much since. There's a little bit of doubt of whether it was really built then, because it was built in 1663. It would have been brand spanking new at the time of the Great Fire, because it is very close to Pudding Lane, but apparently it survived. It also, it survived the Blitz as well. There was a cover to the street, which was bombed. It survived that. So what a tremendous survivor this pub is. A, a, a denizen of British society, the great drinking den survives the fire and the Blitz. Bravo. This is Staple Inn in Hoban, on High Hoban specifically, the highest point in the city of London. And actually these buildings survived the Great Fire, mainly because the fire didn't quite get this far, maybe because of higher ground, whatever the case. But this is a really good example of what a street, whole street would have looked like, like Pudding Lane, what it actually might have looked like in 1666. And you can see how, just dip, how amazingly unfireproof this is, made of wood. And this is why I was talking about the jetties, the little bits that are hanging over the side of it all. How, and then there would have been a, a row of buildings just next to it as well. And they could, you could have passed things over to your neighbour across the street. That's how close they were. So once a building like this went up in flames, the whole road would have got on in there. So this is a good example, except for all the busyness that we have now, a good example of what London would have looked like in the 1660s. Behind me is the Guild Hall, another survivor of the Great Fire, but actually this is a good place to talk about the person I mentioned already, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, the Mayor of London, who by all intents and purposes was a blithering idiot. Indeed, Samuel Pepys describes him as a weak man. Thomas Bloodworth, when he was heard about first the fire putting lane, putting lane, he just dismissed it, saying it would be easily put out, not a problem. Uh, went back to bed. Uh, and then it obviously grew and grew and grew. And I already discussed, he refused to tear people's down, the houses to make the fire breaks, etc, etc. In the end, Samuel Pepys went to see him to say, you need to tell the king to sort things out. By which time, Bloodworth was squirming on the floor, screaming in, in despair and saying, I cannot do this, I cannot do this. Uh, and essentially just was taken, moved away from the scene. Charles II had to come in and solve all the problems for him. So Thomas Bloodworth, a terrible Lord Mayor of London. Behind me, of course, is the famous St. Paul's Cathedral, built after the Great Fire of London by Sir Christopher Wren. Why was it built after the Great Fire of London? Well, of course, the original cathedral was burnt down in the fire. Now, the fire had started, obviously, Sunday morning, way away now, uh, a couple of miles that way, um, Pudding Lane in the city, eastern part of the city. By the Tuesday of that week, uh, it had been, it was unbelievable conflagration, huge temperatures. It had creating its own weather system, and it finally got here to St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, the original St. Paul's Cathedral was actually bigger 
in terms of floor area than the one we have today. You can still see some of the buttresses where the floor plan was. And it was obviously made of wood, but the, the, sort of the frame was sort of made of wood and they had a lead roof and some stone as well. The fire hit the uh, cathedral and burnt the wood that made it that was propping up. So the, the roof caved in on itself. And apparently molten lead ran down the hills and the streets around St. Paul's Cathedral. Whether that's true or not, uh, I don't know. But it was such a symbol of the city, this ginormous thing. For many of these people looked up, it was created by God to be destroyed in the fire would have been unbelievable. And this is perhaps where the significance of the Great Fire of London comes from. Now, just where I'm pointing here by my head here is a phoenix, a phoenix rising from the flames. And it was put there by Sir Christopher Wren to obviously symbolize how London is going to be rebuilt, rebirthed from this great fire like a phoenix from the flames. And that's we can talk a little bit here about what happened after the uh, fire, of course. Various plans were put in for how to rebuild the cities. Lots of Parisian-style boulevards and squares, nothing like the original. And many of the owners of the businesses and the houses, they said, no, we just want where our house was or where our business was. So it was built to the exact same standards as the old, ancient, uh, medieval city. Hence why, when you go to the city of London today, it's full of alleyways and, and various things like that, and small roads going off here. It's the original plan. I think that's great, actually, personally because you've got the little bits you can go into the city. So perhaps one legacy of the Great Fire is we kept it the same. Obviously, we rebuilt it with more stone, etc., etc. I am walking along Farringdon Street, which loosely follows the path of the River Fleet, one of the lost rivers of London. Indeed, the River Fleet will run, it still exists, but it runs underneath us now and it comes out at the River Thames over there. Now, that's actually worth talking about the River Thames as well, but first of all, the significance of the River Fleet to the east of the River Fleet was, of course, the City of London, which was being burnt and uh, all the flames were taken over. To the west, eventually you'd get to Whitehall but, and then there'd be fields, but actually immediately west outside of the city walls was a poorer area called Alsatia and what's interesting is that the fire managed to leap over the river. I don't know how that happens and we're not talking the Mississippi here, it was a quite a small stream essentially but the fire would have leapt over and then started to take over this area, the slums essentially, where the poorer people lived and also took hold there. So it really is starting to grow and grow and grow. Now the Thames as well, we were talking about. Now obviously the city of London was surrounded by walls and you could get out through the gates but they might be a bit blocked so another excellent way to get out of this raging fire is by river and indeed many of the barges including the king's barge and one that samuel peeps managed to commandeer as well met uh, went along all the wharfs and the piers of the river thames and got people out so actually one of the key one of the reasons why the death toll which we'll talk about in a moment is perceived to be low is that so many people got out by the river well, behind me is the Golden Boy of Pie Corner, and this is the furthest extent of the Great Fire of London. This is where the fire started to come under control with the pulling down of the fire breaks and the, the gunpowder, etc., etc., etc. And this is also the moment where the wind had changed and it died down, and they're able to stop the fire. This is by the Wednesday, so having started on the Sunday morning, it destroyed most of the city, of course. Uh, and it was in here. Now, they, they built this memorial. Obviously, there's a huge monument um, to the Great Fire of London, but this is another one. And it's interesting because they obviously wanted to blame somebody. They wanted to find a reason. And then in these pious times, they looked to religion. And they felt that because it started in a bakery in an area famous for its taverns and its bars, etc., they blamed it on the sin of gluttony. They said that London had become too gluttonous, too focused on drinking and eating, and that was the cause of the reason for the Great Fire of London. Whether that's true or not, of course, is up to you. But that was why it symbolized as a fat little boy. This is the monument to the Great Fire of London, but by Robert Hooke, just after the uh, fire, the conflagration ended over by Pie Corner. In fact, you can actually go up it. So maybe, maybe we should climb up it. Actually, before we go up, let's talk death toll. Now, the official death toll is in the single figures between six and eight people, but I think it's more. Let's start with one of the first uh, victims who's not usually counted in that. And actually, they blamed somebody for it, or indeed somebody actually confessed to it. A man called Robert Hubert, who was a French 
watchmaker, he claimed, he came in and confessed, he said, I started the fire and it started in Westminster. Then everybody said to him, naturally the fire didn't ever get to Westminster. He said, oh, no, no, sorry, I got mistaken. Actually, I threw a grenade into the uh, bakery shop in Pudding Lane. I think he was making it up. There is some suggestion he was, you know, not entirely with all his faculties. Indeed, there is some suggestion he may have been tortured to do it because there are several people quite keen to find somebody to blame, especially Thomas Farano, because he was thinking, I want someone else to take the flack. I know it started in my butcher's uh, bakery shop. Can someone else take the blame? He, of course, Robert Uber was tried and was executed. So there's an extra victim for you. Other victims who are not counted are similarly other French and Dutch people. Why? Because England at the time was at war in the Second Anglo-Dutch War between the Dutch and the French. And what do people do in a panic when there's a horrendous situation? They panic and they attack foreigners. And indeed, they attacked any Dutch or Frenchman they could find. And more than attack, they killed, they lynched them, they strung them up and hung them up, or they beat them to death or whatever happens. We don't have the official number of people who were killed this way, but could be a few dozen or so in that way were murdered essentially by racist bigotry and xenophobia. So this number is counting, but it's still not huge amounts until we talk about the records of people who just simply vanished. Where specifically, of course, was that area, Alsatia, the area next to the Fleet River, where the poor slums were, people weren't recorded there. Nobody knows who lived there, and they had people lived in slums. Lots and lots of people living in terrible living conditions in small spaces. They could have been ev eviscerated entirely, no record trace, no trace of them even existing, perhaps, no trace of them certainly dying. So that could be in the hundreds, dare I say, thousands. The final thing to say is, when does the impact of this end? 70,000 people were homeless from this, and it was a cold, cold winter straight after the... November, December of 1666 and the January of 1667, and people died of exposure, of homelessness. Again, hundreds, potentially thousands of people got ill from having to live outside because their houses have been burnt down. So we could be into the high thousands here of people who, are, who were indirectly killed with the Great Fire of London. So you, it's up to you how you decide where the death toll ends. But for me, this was a major, major event. Well, here I am surveying the city of London at the top of the monument to the Great Fire of London. Just above me, you might not be able to see it, is the fiery dome of, of the design we we're pointing out at the bottom. It's a bit windy up here, a bit cold, and quite small and cramped uh, as well. But what a good place to end the surprise. Just think about the legacy of the Great Fire of London. Well, first of all, the physical legacy. You know, the layout of the city of London is broadly very similar to what it had been uh, during the but they built it obviously with stone to replace the wood that was so flammable so there's a bit of a legacy it also had an interesting positive legacy on the monarchy charles ii who the jury was out on him before the great fire because obviously they killed his father in the regicide during the the, the country was still reeling from the english civil war but uh he he took, you know for, after the indecision of the mayor of london bloodworth he came in the king to the river which we can now just see over there and he's the one who ordered the fire breaks etc so he was actually the ones who made the decisions as to what to do. So he was seen more favorably. Well, let's end where we started, looking down on Pudding Lane from the monument of the Great Fire of London. Now it stands at 202 feet tall. It's supposedly, if it fell down, it would land on the spot. But to me, I might not even quite just see a plaque on the ground that we looked at. It seems closer than that so I'm not so sure that's ultimately true but let's end it there thank you so much for joining me on uh, Mr C's History Walk and I shall see you on the next one don't forget to subscribe <laughs>